Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I'm the uh, leader of the user engagement group here at NERSC. I'm going to talk with you about uh, using CrayPat and Reveal on Cori. Okay, so first we're going to talk about profiling with CrayPat, and then um, we're going to talk about how we can use Reveal for our OpenMP. So first of all, profiling with CrayPat. Okay, so first of all, does everyone see the joke in this picture? Right, it's a little, it's a profile, profile of Cochise in the mountain. Everybody see that? Little joke there to uh, hopefully wake you up from your post-lunch coma. Anyway, so I'm going to sort of explain what is CrayPat, show you how to do kind of a simple profiling experiment, and then do more full service profiling. So CrayPat is Cray's performance analysis tool. That's the name, Pat. Um, you can evaluate the, the behavior of your program on a Cray supercomputer, and you can use it under any programming environment. You can use it to find hotspots, find load imbalances, inefficiencies in your code. It'll provide you information about your I.O. and memory usage, your MPI communications, number of flops that you're using. Um, and sometimes it'll even give you a recommendation for a rank reordering. Like if you rerun your program with, uh, with the ranks reordered in this particular way, they, they say, well, we estimate you'll get a little bit better performance. Okay, so it's also, it's primarily it's a profiler and it has some limited tracing abilities. There are better tracing tools out there such as Map and Vampire Trace, but it does do some tracing where it just kind of does a play-by-play, -play, kind of almost like a movie of, of what, what, you've, uh, what your program did. Okay, so Perf Tools Lite is the module that you can do a, a real simple profiling with this module. It's much easier to use than Perf Tools and it does almost everything that you would want to do anyway. So all you have to do in order to use CrayPad, is you just compile your code while you have this Perf Tools Lite module loaded. Then you run your code as normal, and it does an output of standard out, um, and in a .rpt file, it'll give you this little report that has the execution time, the memory high watermark, your aggregate flops rate, um, the top user function that took the most amount of time, information about MPI communications, all kinds of really good stuff. It'll also generate a file that's called a .ap2 file that you can view with Apprentice 2. And that's sort of crazy GUI for uh, CrayPad. And then it might also give you an mpitch rank reorder file, which you can use, uh, like I said, to figure out a good rank reordering that will increase the performance of your code. So, super easy. So here's sort of an example output. So I ran this on a code, <coughs> excuse me, a code that I wrote. Um, so I, you can see I ran it on 64 MPI processes on just one node of, of Cori. Um, and it's sort of giving me some information at the bottom here. It's telling me, well, I spent about uh, almost 560 seconds on average per process. Um, I used about, uh, uh, I guess, almost 1,900 megabytes. Um, my I.O. read and write rates, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, then it gets really interesting. So it, it gives you these tables. So this table is a profile uh, by function group and function. So in my particular case, um, my code spent almost half of its time doing um, sines and cosines and linear algebra. That's the way my code is. Um, and it spent the vast majority of its user time in this function called INTGRD. So actually this is a code that's doing a lot of quadrature. So that's, that's why it's doing all these things. Um, and then it spent a fair amount of time, 14.7% of the time in MPI receive. So uh, that 
suggests maybe a little imbalance. Okay, so how do we do it? First thing is you need to unload the Darshan module. That somehow that always interferes with CrayPat. So um, you need to load the Perf Tools base and Perf Tools light modules. Perf Tools base just has all of the man pages for the Perf Tools. It doesn't actually really do anything. And that way you can actually load that and look at them before you actually <coughs> run with Perf Tools. And so then once you have Perf Tools light loaded, you can <coughs> compile and run your code as usual, just like you normally would. There's a slight overhead, but it's not a very big overhead when you're running these jobs. All right, so <coughs> Perf Tools Lite serves the purpose for most people. It does what most people would ever need. You, most people would not need to move on to full service profiling. But if maybe you need more information than Perf Tools Lite provides, um, maybe you want to ignore certain subroutines. There's, maybe there's a subroutine that gets called a lot, but you don't care about that one. You just want to look at all the other ones. Um, you might want to focus on a particular class of functions um, to see how it, those particular class of functions is performing. And maybe if you want to do the tracing that I had talked about rather than just the profiling. So if, if any of those things apply to you, then you might want to try more of a full service profiling. So I'm going to give you a super deluxe profiling recipe and tell you about some of the options to pat build. Okay, so uh, again, you've got to unload Darshan. If it's already loaded, you need to unload it. And then uh, you load Perf Tools Base and Perf Tools. Compile your code as usual, making sure that you preserve the object files. So if you have a code where the make file deletes all of the .o files, then um, try to make it not do that because it needs those files. Okay, so then our next step is pat build. There's a, something called pat build. And so you do pat underscore build minus capital O APA my app. Okay, assuming that's the name of your application, my app. And that's going to generate an executable called my app plus pat. So you run that and it results in an output file that is either my app plus pat plus then some numbers dot xf or if you ran on a lot of processors, then it's going to create a directory called that, and it's going to have .xf files, multiple .xf files in that directory. Okay, so next thing that you do is after you have those .xf files, you're going to do pat report on those, and it'll generate um, my app plus pat plus um, star apa. Um, and then you take that and you use that to build another executable called my app plus APA. Um, so I'm not sure what APA stands for. Something like a, I don't know what the A is, the first A, but it's like procedural analysis. It's like looking, it's like kind of generally taking a summarizing look at what's going on in your code. And then it's going to focus in this next step it's going to focus on particular subroutines or functions that are run a lot. Okay, so then you run this my app plus APA. You run that like regular, and then you uh, you get out this these .xf files again, and you do pat report on that, and then that tells you um, that'll give you all the information you ever wanted. Okay, so. There's some options to pat build. So the, that minus capital O APA, which we talked about in our super deluxe recipe there, um, it will be, so it'll sample to determine which subroutines we can ignore when we're running our super deluxe full run to get all of the information. So it produces a, dot APA file from pat report. And so then after that run, you just execute pat build uh, minus O on this APA file, and that re-instruments your application into my app plus APA, which is the one 
that's the final one that you're going to use to get the performance info. Okay. <clears throat> Next option is minus g trace group. So trace group is just a group of functions that they think you might be interested in. So one of them would be like MPI. Like maybe you're just really interested in finding out all of the behavior of MPI calls in particular in your code. You don't care about anything else. So you could select that as your trace group. Um, other options would be like BLAS, FFTW, um, PETC, NetCDF. <coughs> Okay, then there's um, minus W, and minus W will do tracing rather than profiling. So profiling and tracing, let me clarify completely so everybody understands this. So tracing is where you really are kind of like almost creating a movie of what happened in your code. It's kind of a time, time lapse of what happens in your code. Um, not the individual values in your code per se, but like all of the calls of the subroutines and all of the um, memory usage and all those things. Um, profiling is just more like you're just taking samples and it's sort of a static thing not dependent on time. So it'll find like high water marks or low water marks, but it's not going to tell you you, you um, spiked up in your memory usage at this particular point, whereas uh, tracing would tell you something like that. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears slightly. I'm going to talk about using Cray Reveal to uh, parallelize your code. So Reveal is this handy tool. I don't know if anyone else here besides me is super lazy. I'm super lazy. I I readily admit that. So I don't like to actually try to figure out um, how, to, how to use OpenMP to parallelize my code, but Reveal will do that for me. So that's pretty awesome. That's why I like Reveal. So it's a tool for porting your code to a shared memory or offload programming model, but of course we're focusing on shared memory here. Um, you combine profiling info that you get from CrayPet, which is why I told you about CrayPet first, and Cray compiler annotations to determine where we can place OpenMP directives. And those OpenMP directives are generated automatically, like I said, so I don't even have to figure it out. It just does it for me. So that's super great. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, it works only in the Cray programming environment. Now, CrayPet itself, you can use it with the Cray programming environment, the Intel programming environment, or the GNU programming environment. But because this relies on compiler annotations, then we have to use the Cray compiler because that's the one that Cray used when they developed this tool. Okay, simple five steps for using Cray Reveal. Number one, compile your code with perf tools light loops to set up perf tools work loop estimates experiment. Number two, run a representative job, job that you that is typical of your code. Number three, rebuild it with the CCE program library. Number four, run reveal. And number five, insert directives, think about loop reordering and analyze performance from those optimizations, and then leather, rinse, repeat, go back to the top. Okay, so for step one, here's how we do it. First, we gotta unload Darshan, always have to do that. Then we gotta get into the Cray programming environment. And then um, we load Perf Tools Base, because you have to always load that, and Perf Tools Light Loops. Okay, so then you just compile and link as normal. Okay. Okay. Second step: just run a normal representative job like you normally would. And when I say a representative job, I mean something that runs in a relatively short amount of time, maybe half hour or something like that. But it performs proportionally the same work as a typical production run. So, you, if there's some part of your code that you know it spends the bulk of its time in, 
in this run, you also want it to spend the bulk of its time doing that. Okay, um, so the output of this run is going to include a .ap2 file with loop work estimates in it. Okay, um, so in order to do this, make sure that we're in the Cray environment, and then we um, make sure that we have unloaded this perf tool light loops, because we don't need that anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we compile and link with this minus H PL. <coughs> Excuse me. And what that means is a program library. Could somebody pass me my water bottle there? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm trying to get over a cold here. Okay. So we've got, we want to create this program library. And what that is, is that is where the compiler kind of makes some notes to you about what it did and what it, or what it didn't do and why. So it'll, it'll be like, um, well, I tried to, I, I, you know, I, I tried to um, vectorize this loop, but I couldn't because you had this conditional statement in it. Or, I tried, to, um, I tried to reorder this other loop, and I was able to do that. So it'll tell you both successes and failures. Okay, um, so <coughs> you, you got to add this minus HPL equals some full path for a program library directory to get your compiler feedback all put into that same directory. So if you don't put a full path there, um, then it'll do a relative path, which works if you have all of your code in one directory. But if you don't have all of your code in one directory, then it'll make that relative to whichever directory it moves into while it's doing the make. So then it'll be in multiple places and reveal won't work because it won't be able to find it. So it needs to be, everything needs to be put into one directory. Okay. Um, so then you just make your, make your code just like you normally would. It's just that you have this particular um, compiler flag, minus HPL equals the name of this directory. Okay. So, so then, you, uh, then you run reveal. So you can do it in one of two ways. You can do uh, reveal um, with just the compiler info only, or you can do reveal with the compiler info and the profiler info info that you got in this .ap2 file. Okay, so here um, I did it on my code that I had profiled previously. So you can, you can see all these great uh, names of functions that are quadrature functions, so DFS, HRE, that's a quadrature function, some really old quadrature thing. Okay, so here, there's, it, you can open up the scoping window here. Um, so, yeah, so this, this is kind of like a list of all of the files that might have loops in them that I could scope. So uh, you can pick all of them. You can pick from that list. Do I want to scope it or do I not? Okay, so here is um, an example, compiler annotations and explanations. So this particular line here in DLHRE or whatever the name of my file is, um, I'm on line 133 because I have it uh, highlighted here. It says, uh, so it has a, a red circle if it's a bad thing, and it has a green square if it's a good thing. And this is sort of a okay thing, like a maybe thing. So. <coughs> From my compiler annotations, um, they, they, they say that a loop starting at line 133 was not vectorized because it contains a call to a function. Okay, so that's why uh, the compiler looked at it and said, no, nope, no can do. Uh, there's a call to a function in there. And similarly, a loop starting at line 144, which is within the scope of this loop, this is like an inner loop, 
It says, um, it wasn't vectorized because it contains a call to a subroutine on line 152. Okay, fair enough. And then we have some kind of mixed success here. Um, a loop starting at line 152 was partially vectorized with a single vector iteration. Okay, <laughs> that's great. So I had some mixed successes in this particular um, file. So then here's another one where I had much better luck. So if you look on the side here, this is like a list. So I'm, I'm in program view. I can choose different views. I can choose program view. I can choose loop view. I can choose a, a bunch of different views. So in this particular file, dfshre.f, um, in this particular subroutine, I have three loops that it says, I think I can parallelize these loops. I have th three loops that it can't parallelize, and then I have another loop where it says it can't. So I might have some successes in this subroutine um, putting in some OpenMP. Okay, so I'm just picking one of these examples. So I can click on the loop and I can get it to scope that loop. And so it's showing me all of the variables associated with this particular loop. And it says what type of a variable they are, a scalar or an array. It says the scope that they should have, whether they're a private variable or a shared variable. <laughs> or sometimes it can't figure it out, and I'll show you what it says there. OK, so then I can, um, so this is just a close-up of this little part right down here. So I can hit the show directive right there, and it'll actually show me that directive. So this is the directive that it would put into my code if I wanted to for the OpenMP. So you can see it says directive inserted by query reveal. So that's always also very helpful. You can have it say that, and then you don't have to. You can always find these directives that Reveal put in. Um, so this is the way that they would write my directive for me. So that's fantastic, because then I don't have to try to figure <coughs> out whether things are private or shared, because Reveal does it itself. I don't have to worry. OK, now here's another case where I had an unsuccessful scoping. and. Um, a big problem here is that there are a bunch of variables where it just can't figure it out. It can't figure out whether it should be a shared variable or a private variable, or if there's some other issue here. So it, it scopes it as unresolved, uh, unresolved. And the reason is it says there's a possible recurrence involving this object. So it, can't, it doesn't know what to do with it at all. Um, and then this one, it's like, well, assuming there's no conflict in scatter, then we can, um, we can, we can do that. So, it's, so there's a bunch of issues, though, that it's having. So if I were to just say, eh, whatever, I don't care about those issues, whatever, reveal, I, I'm smarter than you are. And so then I get the directive here. This is what the directive is going to look like. So you notice it's got the private variables and the shared variables. It also has unresolved variables. But unresolved is not a keyword in, in OpenMP. So when I, try to, when I stick this in my code and I try to compile it, compiler's going to fail. It's going to say, hey, this is an error. I don't even know what you're talking about. What's re unresolved? OK. Yeah. That's just the little hand there to just show you. Unresolved. It's going to do that. OK. OK, so um, our next step, this should be step five, <laughs> is we insert our directives. So I had some successful directives in there. I could have <laughs> inserted them. And then um, another thing to do is also look at the compiler feedback to determine a potential, any potential for loop reordering. So you can also get much improved performance by reordering loops sometimes. And the compiler feedback will often tell you, it'll say, well, um, I uh, tried, I reordered this loop. Um, so you could, re you could reorder it yourself. 
um, to get that type of performance out of other compilers. Or you could um, also look at some of the other feedback that you get like, oh, well, there's this conditional if statement inside of a loop. And then maybe if you can figure out a way to get that out of there, then it could vectorize that loop or whatever. So um, the Cray compiler is like really good at optimizing code. It's actually amazing. Um, the Fortran compiler in particular is very strong. But sometimes it requires a little help from humans. Uh, so that's just something to, to note. Um, so then after you have um, in inserted your directives, and then you, can, you should just uh, try it out again, see how your performance is after these optimizations. Lather, rinse, repeat. So your performance now is better in this subroutine, but now there's another subroutine that's taking up all your time. So then examine that one. Use Cray Reveal to figure out if you could parallelize that with OpenMP. And just keep going until you have a perfect code that works perfectly all the time, which I know everyone will get there someday. Okay, so that's all I have. Are there any questions?